I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Today I'm with Franz Narada in Austria, a visionary of the Global Villages movement and uh, an independent thinker extraordinaire who I worked with when I organized independent thinkers. So I want to uh, present uh, uh, Franz's ways of looking at things. And so um, why don't I start um, by letting you introduce yourself, Franz. Yes, hello. Um, I am 70 years old, soon, very soon. Uh, and uh, so I have had a life uh, which was kind of double. Uh, I was hotel director and uh, and uh, that was for making a living in our family hotel in Vienna. On the other side, I was a person that uh, studied the world to make it better. I studied sociology, philosophy, and other disciplines, political science, um, trying to figure out why this society is not working in an optimal way. It is uh, it is a society in which people uh, very often just clash and collide and block each other instead of supporting each other. That was my very elemental experience from my childhood, not only in my family, but also everywhere around. We had a, we had a restaurant, we had an inn, and uh, I spoke to many guests and they complained about their lives and things like that, you know. And I said, why is everybody so unhappy? Why don't we contribute to each other's happiness? You know, this is this is how everything started. And uh, at some point with 17 years, I decided I will write a book, The System of Happiness, <laughs> so to say. Um, I want to uh, defend the idea that uh, the coordination between human aspirations is very necessary. And uh, at that time, I was, uh, you could say, I was influenced by technocratic thoughts. I thought uh, this has to be managed. You know, the, uh, I was reading uh, the book uh, Walden II by, by, uh, uh, by Skinner, you know, the, 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 the <laughs> psychologist who who uh, tried to manipulate rats and people at the same time with reinforcing behavior. And <clears throat> for me, uh, uh, the fact that everybody said, what a horrible idea, that was a provocation. And I said, okay, no, it's, it's a great idea uh, to connect people in their aspirations instead of having them clash all the time against each other. And to find out why people have this uh, uh, inability to sense how they can contribute to each other's well-being and happiness. So that led me to study sociology, and uh, that led me to uh, ask the question, how can uh, we as scientists uh, contribute to uh, an optimum interconnection. Uh, this is relating to my deepest value that uh, Andreas will definitely bring up very soon uh, between people. And uh, and of course, the the disappointment was was pre-programmed because uh, uh, the academia did not really care about uh, uh, people and uh, and their uh, problems. It was rather how should I say, it was rather an endeavor of asking questions that nobody would ask and re neglecting the, the questions that people had. So I became like a, a, a critic, criticist of, of, uh, of the humanities. I said uh, they are heavily biased ideologically in justification in in uh, of the of the current state of things, and they are not uh, they are not able to uh, to uh, admit 
that we are in a wrong way of uh, social relations, in a wrong system of social relations. One that, um, uh, 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 <clears throat> that favors competition uh, above cooperation and things like that. You know? And uh, and that uh, led me to become uh, politically active. That led me to become, uh, so to say, attached to to Marxist thoughts. And uh, and uh, later on, I discovered uh, that there were some fundamental flaws in terms not that the the, the insights or the, the the findings about uh, this whole capitalist system were wrong, but there is definitely a, a, a need to indicate much more precisely where we should go. So uh, as, uh, as a young person, I read a ton of, of science fiction. And uh, I think uh, that was that was very, very, uh, very uh, influence, a uh, big influence on me to see that the future holds a lot of possibilities. And we we need to we need to uh, understand the possibilities, favor the good ones, find out uh, the ones that uh, that we we uh, think could solve the problems of of the current society. So, yeah, and in uh, in in this way, I was uh, uh, torn into uh, several phases of uh, of recalibrating myself. The first phase was that I went to the United States and I, I discovered uh, the alternatives movement in the United States. And that was really the thing that was missing in Europe. Uh, people who uh, intentionally created mini models of society that uh, should work as a blueprint model or whatever, uh, how uh, it uh, at, at the large scale things could work. This kind of realizing utopian vision, trying them out, experimenting with them in a laboratory situation, that influenced me very much. And uh, that was one thing that uh, was uh, very impressive. The other thing was the technological progress. I was, I was, uh, coming uh, out also of the discovery of the potential of the personal computer. I was working for Apple computer. I was doing hypercard support and I was sensing that this is a revolutionary machine that will change the world. And so uh, for the first few years, I, I saw the change that will happen within the computer. But later on, I said, no, the, 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 the changes will happen when the computer mediates the exchange of knowledge and uh, the communication between people. And uh, it became more interesting for me to ask what will happen uh, if the computer becomes more important than the automobile? Uh, what will happen if uh, it, it is our main means of transportation? We transport ideas instead of uh, physical goods or persons. And, and that uh, led me to the idea of uh, global villages. I should say that I was deeply impressed at that time also uh, uh, about uh, uh, from uh, uh, by uh, the feeling of life in Greek villages. You know, uh, there is an authentic uh, <clears throat> miniaturized city feeling. You know, people would not just uh, hide in their houses, but uh, at every uh, afternoon, when the work was finished, they would convene at the at the uh, platea, the, the 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 village square, where there were three, four coffee houses, and there would people would 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 chat with each other. They would they had their own rituals to find a company for the night. Uh, they call it the 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 volta. That is like a a walk uh, in uh, in a way that you can uh, make a lot of encounters, <laughs> and, and then they, they they found the company for the night. And I was very impressed by these rituals that this Greek society had developed for everyday life, which which uh, made it possible for people to connect locally, 
and to to really experience their community much more. So and you experienced this in Greece, you're saying, right? Yes, uh, where yes, where yes. where exactly in? Um, mainly in the island of Samos. That was uh, was uh, a place uh, where I got stuck because I I was like uh, adopted, almost adopted by a Greek family, so to say, adopted. You know, where there was a disabled girl and. Uh, uh, she had a lot of medical problems. We helped her with her medical treatment in Vienna, and it was like a, a cascade of of mm -hmm. reinforcing relations. And uh, so, of course, that meant uh, uh, in this island I had a lot of access to people and uh, and to means of transportation, whatever I needed. And so I I, I could uh, I could uh, easily go there, go around, and. Uh, uh, and it is a, a very beautiful island with high mountains and with a lot of diversity. <clears throat> I also was in Crete, but not so often. And uh, and uh, I, I really felt this uh, micropolis. Um, this 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 is a fantastic way of linking humans to nature. It is like a very dense core of uh, of uh, encounter. Uh, and at the same time, the whole thing blends beautifully into nature, and uh, and it it is a type of village that uh, that kind of sort of made me think about the optimum human environment to live. And I thought this is it. And so when I combined that with my thoughts from the U.S. about uh, uh, using the computer as a tool to uh, exchange knowledge with the world. I think this combination uh, made me pretty sure that our future uh, could be in a new type of village, which is like a miniaturized city. And so, uh, of course, many, many things that uh, I also saw so in the United States uh, helped me to to refine that concept. For example, uh, visiting Arcosanti, uh, uh, a place in the desert in Arizona, where the uh, Italian, uh, an architect of Italian origin, he was a, uh, his name was Paolo Soleri, and uh, he has had was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright, and uh, in a sharp contrast to his teacher, he wanted to miniaturize the city and uh, create density as uh, as the prime condition for sophistication. And even sustainability, duration, he said, every uh, organism that wants to survive needs to save time and space. So eventually, miniaturization uh, begets uh, uh, complexity, or complexity begets miniaturization. Uh, and uh, this is the, this is the, the uh, how should I say, the, the the precondition for duration, you know, for for being able to adapt to a lot of circumstances. And what is true for every bacterium, what is true for every animal, what is true for every plant, that it has an opt a more optimum size, should also be true for the external body of the human, the, the city. So he, he he built a city of village size, and that that was that was something that that. Uh, really really impressed me another thing that uh, that helped me uh, really dive into this deeper was uh, the encounter with douglas engelbart uh, now uh, it seems that this is not relating to 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 space uh, uh, but uh, it's 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 about the method of of uh, inquiry and uh, and uh, scientific uh, uh, progress. Engelbart had this idea uh, of a multidisciplinary community to solve complex problems. Um, so any innovation in society uh, would stem from this, what he called bootstrap communities. So uh, bootstrap communities uh, were collections of people with totally different backgrounds. And he said, I met him in 1990 in his office in Stanford, in Sweet Hall. 
and uh, and he sent me down to the Institute for the Research on Learning to to get an idea what he was uh, uh, what he was uh, uh, having in mind, and there I, I discovered a, an environment where they studied uh, uh, computerized learning or the learning with new technologies by bringing people together from all involved groups, you know, children, parents, teachers, uh, cognition psychologists, programmers, uh, uh, communication uh, um, experts, and so on and so on, interface experts and so on. So this, this mingling of totally different uh, um, characters, uh, that was Engelbart's idea. Uh, he influenced that very heavily. Also, this 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 setup uh, of uh, a bootstrap community that would be able to uh, act as a mini model of a complex society um, dealing with the optimum solutions for the adoption of uh, technology uh, to society. So, and. And Engelbart was the one who said to me, I don't care if you, uh, he said, first of all, I'm happy that uh, uh, I can receive a sociologist. You know, this this was, and I said, wow, here is the almost the, the Pope of the Silicon Valley, you know, the, 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 the person that gave the mother of all demos, you know, and who was already thinking about hypertext in the 60s and realizing them on mainframes. And and uh, he had he, he had immense influence. We we don't value this, but he was the father or the grandfather of things like Xerox Park and uh, and everything Steve Jobs uh, grabbed there originally comes from him. You know, and I knew that. And and this guy says we need sociologists. You know, he he said we need people who who who, who can help us arrange this this uh, diverse communities. And then he said, so, but it is very important that you as the, as the facilitator of a bootstrap community, you have a clear vision that you want to achieve, you know? And so said, he said, what is your vision? And I, I told him all my life, I had felt uncomfortable with the density and, uh, and the, 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 stuffiness of, 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 of large cities, even Vienna, which is not a large city, was too anonymous and too, too uh, how should I say, too polluted. Well, what you, you can say uh, that the, 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 the resources of life are scarce in cities. And so I said, I would like uh, to uh, change the face of this planet. So we have very bright, intelligent, small villages, village communities that are much more autonomous and they are much more able uh, to create their own cultures. And at the same time, they are functioning like a global brain. So um, held together by the networks of communication. And, uh, and he said, just go for it. That's a good idea. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> he said, I, 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 I'm, charging managers for, uh, how should I say, for this spreading such ideas, $10,000 a day. So you should not worry about your future. <laughs> and uh, and it was like you you receive uh, uh, a knighting, you know, <laughs> you receive uh, you receive this honor of being considered. Uh, oh, uh, like uh, inducted, yeah, but, you were you were inducted by, yes, yeah, knighted, yeah. yes. I was knighted by my, so uh, when I left his office, my project was born. I said, "Okay, I'm going to create a laboratory for global villages," and uh, and that is what what I then uh, tried to do. That was in 1990. Now we have 23. That so, was in 1990. 1990, yes. Okay. So that was 34 years ago. We have 20, 24 now. Yeah. So that uh, uh, the first thing I did, uh, I, I gave a lot of speeches at many, many different uh, um, professional assemblies. Yeah, ecologists, architects, uh, teachers, uh, um, landscape uh, 
um, and regional developments and things like that, you know. So, and I said to them, we we need to un understand that the potential of communication is going to change our whole physical structure of life. And we need to do research on that. And that research can only be done in a new way because the change is happening so fast. We need to we need to have uh, these little bootstrap communities that help us uh, discover the best solutions. That was the original idea of, of DIV, the Global Integrated Village Environment. Which is the name of your laboratory. And so I'll just jump in now to say we have about six minutes left. Uh, this is a wonderful start. You've given about almost 20, I think, ways of figuring things out, which is what I wanted to do. And we'll have more conversations. But um, as we kind of close up this session, uh, you mentioned, uh, and I, um, we, we know each other since 2003, uh, when I was organizing independent thinkers, and I realized that really I could, uh, you were uh, extraordinary, independent, outstanding independent thinker that I should organize around, you know, and to, and that was quite, uh, uh, that worked very well. You led our Global Villages Working Group. And so I asked you, uh, what's your key concept? And you talked about Global Villages. We had a Global Villages Working Group that you led uh, for in my laboratory, Minchu Sodas. But um, uh, then I l later realized, well, this is really about asking about somebody's deepest value. And I think uh, you mentioned optimal uh, interconnection. Yes, or optimal, optimal interconnection. Inter that's how you would say it, right? Optimal inter interconnection. And what do you mean by that? By this, I mean that everybody has good intentions, but uh, um, we rarely find a way that good intentions are valued and rewarded. And uh, we need uh, we need to to see how the potential of each and everybody's uh, aspirations contributes. To the progress of others, you know, this is this is this is basically a world that I want to see, where uh, where everybody is analyzed in their or is understood in their unique contribution to uh, the interplay of aspirations and 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 and, and uh, actions. So. Uh, and so you have this life of visionary aspiration, you know, with the regards to, uh, of course, yourself, but with regard to other people, how to have this community, this world of aspirations, you know, of, of all these, you know, aspiratory villages, maybe. Um, what I want to ask, um, and so I just say that because we'll be working um, with uh, Daniel Ari Friedman, with Jerry Northrup and, and others on this whole human engineering of um legacy such as this so that'll be a topic but i want to ask you uh, how would you say uh, what is your relationship with truth how would you describe that i think uh truth is essential as a as a as a concept and as as it is it is it is <laughs> when most philosophers are are putting a lot of question marks around truth but in fact, uh, the process of thinking is uh, a constant progress from the appearance to the essence, you know. And uh, and the, the way it works is that we are understanding that we have to put uh, uh, our own perception into perspective. And by putting our own perception into an external perspective, we come closer to truth. So it is. It is always this process of reflection, uh, which uh, which uh, produces something like uh, away from the from the original separatedness from the appearance and the essence um, to their to their. Uh, deeper relation uh, relatedness you know so that uh, i i'm i'm very much following hegel's uh, idea of uh, of the of the uh, uh, of the of the the first thing that you can say about the essence is that it appears <laughs> so it is uh, it is a, a a process of dialectical uh, uh, shedding light uh, between the appearance and the things that we conceptualize 
and, uh, so, and, uh, and so is the truth for you, is it more the process or the destination, you know, the final state or the, because you say we get closer to it, but on the other hand, you emphasize the process. I think I emphasize the process uh, because uh, that is something that, uh, that uh, I also had to experience painfully that uh, we 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 might always overlook one perspective which is essential and uh, which uh, um, uh, which we yeah which we think is irrelevant but but then we find out it is very relevant and, uh, i like the idea of of, of marshall McLuhan's uh, uh, development of media very much that uh, we have one medium with which we perceive the world and by using that one medium, we uh, we kind of sort of uh, put things into obsolescence, and we we on, on the other side we retrieve things, we uh, we we bring them back in from our memory into the present. And when uh, when a medium uh, has reached its full potential, uh, suddenly it reverses into another medium. Uh, that that can give us uh, a new perspective and and an and, and expanded uh, view of the world. So, I think uh, on one side I am uh, totally uh, supporting the idea of truth as the as the motor of of progress, and on the other side I say that uh, we probably should refrain from saying we have reached absolute truth in a certain given moment. That is, uh, from my own life experience, um, that is uh, very dangerous. Uh, it makes us blind. So, Franz, I'm uh, thinking uh, how to word what you said, and this is what I'm writing. Truth is a dialectical process of reflection that places our multiple perspectives into an external perspective, thus progresses from an appearance of separateness to the essence of deeper relation. You could frame it like that too, but it is not exactly... Uh, uh, so how would be better? What would be better? Like, so I, I have three parts here, basically, because you said so many things. So, you know, but the question is like, so what is the truth? You know, is it the process? Is it the, is it something else? But I wrote, so truth is a dialectical process of reflection. Does that sound right? Yes, so far, yes. Okay. You know, if I had to say it in one word, I'd say, well, Franz says truth is a process, you know, right? Or, or, or a dialectic, maybe that places our multiple perspectives into an external perspective. Uh, here I, I would be uh, a little bit hesitant mm -hmm. because um, the first thing that, uh, that uh, reflection means that uh, we, have, we have words and we have uh, we have perceptions mm -hmm. and, uh, and they fall apart um, and uh, this falling apart like you could Hegel this uh, he, he, is, he is illustrating that when we use the word this yeah uh, this can be a lamp or this can be uh, a mirror or this could be uh, earphones so this can mean everything and nothing mm -hmm. so um we have to be aware that uh, we are using a term that is too general to uh, specify what exactly we are meaning. And so this specification of with what we are meaning, um, this is a process of reflection. You know, we say, okay, the word refers uh, to this and this and this perceptions and the perceptions they have their internal coherence in something that can only ex be expressed as a thought mm -hmm. it cannot be perceived in itself so this is this is uh the first uh, the dialectic of of uh 
how should I say, perception and 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 and, and concept or the of of uh, perception and notion or something like you, that. You're saying that the coherence, which is so important here, is in the thought. It's they're coherent in, in the thought is where the coherence is. That's that, what you're saying. That, that is important that we uh, we reconstruct uh, the the coherence of our perceptions in the thought, which means that uh, this is this is this is a, a subjective effort. Mm -hmm. But it brings us closer to truth. So there is uh, there is no contradiction between the actions of uh, of, of of the thought uh, and uh, the coming closer to the objective truth. So th th this is a work of thought that makes us have uh, a, a clearer image or a clearer uh, notion of uh, what we what we. What we have to do with, you know, what what we what we want to analyze. So so, uh, or what we are dealing with, whatever it is. It is not just science who's work, which is working like that. It's 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 everybody is working on the same is is walking on the same road. Uh, everybody has to do this work of uh, linking their uh, their perceptions to concepts. Uh, there is no there is no exception uh, otherwise we wouldn't be able to to communicate as humans language is very important because it uh, it helps us to fix uh to fix the the uh the concepts in 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 something that can be shared at the same time uh this uh, this uh language is not arbitrary it is it is uh, the work of thought that makes it, how should I say, that makes it something meaningful, and that uh, that work of thought is 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 kind of sort of uh, transmitted from generation to generation. It's a it's a it's like a it's like a process which goes on and on and on and 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 and, and helps us to to discover uh, the the truth of the world more and more. If I make myself understandable, I don't know. Yeah, so I, I rewrite it and reword it now like this, like, truth is a work of thought, linking perceptions to concepts, uh, which makes us have, um, well, which makes an, our image clear, meaningful, shareable, transmittable, but especially transmittable, I think. Yes, yes, yes. So... I mean, so then what I would say, like in one word, like, you know, Franz Narad would say truth as work, you know, that truth is work. <laughs> it's a yes, work of yes. thought. It links perceptions to concepts, right? Uh, yielding um, yielding a transmittable image, I guess. Uh, yes. Because if it's transmittable, then uh, then it's also clear, hopefully, and uh, shared. And this is the moment. This is the moment where the perspectives of others come in. You know, this is this is uh, this is the moment when we we put uh, we put our uh, concepts to the test uh, in the communication with others. Yeah, and I think that 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 becomes. Um... I mean, this could almost be pushed further, you know, like in terms of like, what is, what are you talking about? But I think it's kind of implied that uh, there is a world of uh, shared, un where shareable understanding, you know, like that you are integrating yourself into a world where other people can integrate themselves and have a, you know, have a world of truth. So truth is the work that you do personally you know that this is personal work in a sense but to with a social fruit let's say yes yes and of course uh, your personal work is not starting from point zero uh, but it is uh, it is uh, um how should i say the starting point often is the result of many many generations of of, of thinkers and thoughts you know so mm -hmm. we we uh, we always stand at the uh, on the shoulders of giants when we when we continue our work. Uh, of course, uh, not necessarily, but but ideally, um, this is a process which uh, has a, a kind of sort of logic of progress. So just to say it one more time and get your uh, your your check on this, but uh, 
Truth is a work of thought, linking perceptions to concepts, yielding a transmittable image. Yes. Okay. And then, and so, and then truth is work. <laughs> that's, the, that's the one word, you know, because uh, so, and it says so much. Um, and for me, this is very uh, precious. Uh, and I think our listeners will see like, wow, you know, you have so much packed into this and you were able to say this so readily, you know, you know, this is your life that you live, you know, this is how, and you can, I think also like this idea that, oh, your deepest value is optimal interconnection, you see, then you can imagine if there's this landscape of truth, you know, and this is where you are, this is how you understand, you know, where you see that landscape of truth. Well, if God goes to you and looks through, you know, Franz Narada, God, the spirit, will see uh, optimal interconnection. You see, the spirit of this love, you know, looking through your eyes, this divine love would see optimal inter interconnection because that's what, that's what you're, that's what, that's where you are, you know, in position, you know, that's, that's what that yields. That's a, so that's a very, uh, I think scientifically, you see, that's a very, so like for me, you know, truth is absolute view. Kind of like God looking through me, you know. So my deepest value is living by truth. Okay. So for for other people it will be, but they always seem to match in that way. So, and then also um we all have different answers with our relationship with truth, but we're all talking about the same truth, you know, which is very interesting. It's not like that there's seven or five or two different kinds, like we're just talking about it uh, as if we were standing in a different position, looking at it from a different angle, uh, you know, or being on a different place on the map. But we all agree on the on the what truth seems to be. And we all kind of agree on the map and what the map seems to be. And you said it exactly like it's linking perceptions to concepts. There's this correspondence aspect between these two minds, like the unconscious has, let's say, perceptions and the conscious has this language of concepts. And can the unconscious and the kind of like the two hemispheres, you know, can they match up? And there's a third mind. I claim like consciousness is the mind that makes sure that they match up correctly. So con and so that's the mind that works. Right? Let's see. That's it's because it's work, you know, to um, uh, and I can go more into that. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, no one will believe me. Oh, that this this absolute truth or this wonder so is whatever. But see, if we have this project where people are saying, let's collect these relationships with truth. Let's start to realize, hey, we can map that out. Let's try to see the connections between other data, like the deepest value. And then all of a sudden people realize, oh, well, we do have two minds, you see, for perception and for, let's say, the concept, something like that. It's just that different people see that correspondence in different places. So like my friend uh, Raimond Svetkavich, he'll say, oh, well, truth is being correct about, you know, whatever the domain of life you know, you're dealing with. So for him, the correspondence is way out somewhere in practical life, right? Like it's very physical and practical and, you know, et cetera. Whereas, you know, for, for uh, John Brett, the really truth is metaphor. You know, everything is a metaphor. Okay, well, that's, but that's kind of like interior, right? For other people, it'd be like uh, truth is is like an agreement. You know, it's a social agreement. Or like for Kirby Erner, it is a defensive strategy. Or for me, it's like this, you know, way back here behind me, you know, there's some kind of God looking through me, right? Like, but so those are all different places where that correspondence can be taking place. So how do we draw that map? I don't know, but that's almost like an art project. So Daniel um, is an artist. Uh, and so to work with, you know, to employ our artistic thinking. And I know of many times I've tried to make a map of the deepest values, but they were so colorful, just so dynamic it just seemed you know i collected 800 or so it just seemed impossible but you see these it's like these uh, relationships with uh, truth are like black and white it's the black and white version so it's much more believable that possibly we could make a map you see and then all of a sudden we get a map of deepest values i think along with that or and once we have this map of deepest values i think we get a map of like investigatory questions like your deepest value is what you know but then you realize, well, what don't you know? So you ask all these, other, it's like a star in the sky. You see from your point, the whole sky, but you can ask the other stars. Okay, well, exactly like what you did when you talk to architects and you talk to, let's say, ecologists and you talk maybe to librarians or so, and you're asking, well, how can we, you know? So um, 
Okay, so so that's what we'll talk about. I, I hope like when maybe on Tuesday, like these types of things, like what are practical grounds for this type of deep understanding? And another one is these uh, ways of figuring things out. So it's amazing. You know, I, I wrote down like maybe 20 that you gave in this uh, account of your life. Uh, can I just rattle them off? In the, just so That's that you, yeah, yeah. Do so like discovering people's aspirations. That's a way of figuring things out. Um, and then uh, reading science fiction, right? Like, so getting, you know, um, uh, studying thinkers like Marx, right? Uh, traveling to other countries, US, Greece, Arcosanti, uh, uh, learning uh, from, oh, various movements, right? Like social movements, participating in a technological environment or world, right? Like you get that hands-on participation. Uh, asking what would happen type of questions, right? Like what would happen if the world changed this that, that way? Uh, seeing the possibilities of technology, right? Uh, getting involved in people's lives. So for example, uh, helping that um, young uh, girl, you know, who was uh, uh, in Samos, right? Who was sick. Well, you learn things by getting involved, you know, by having a heart, right? Um, uh, in turn, well, people engaging people, oh, engaging people in conversation, interacting with people. So in Samos, you know, you just have this uh, propensity to talk to people and just, you just enjoy talking or conversing or, you know, presenting ideas. So, well, you learn a lot by, you know, you've done that with tens of thousands of people probably, right? So, so that's a way, you know, that's why you have as a sociologist some in, insights into, well, you know, what, what, what is a society like? Um, this aesthetic view of saying, well, like you aesthetically, like you want culture and nature to blend. That's an aesthetic way of figuring things out, right? Um, seeking optimality in all these types of things. Um, appreciating and distilling concepts. So like when you're listening to uh, Doug and Gobert, like, you know, that uh, this idea, oh no, this was, uh, I'm sorry, Paulo Soleri, like miniaturization, density, complexity. But like what I see is like you're latching on to interesting concepts that you think are meaningful. So like latching on to concepts, that's a way of figuring things out. But you also like latch on to um, uh, social solutions. So like when you were Doug Engelbart, like, oh, this is like a social solution. Um, uh, so appreciating, collecting, absorbing them, right? Uh, appreciating visionary thinkers. So you're always collecting thinkers like that. You're saying, oh, like, you know, they just, uh, you know, you may talk to tens of thousands of people, but there's like hundreds of people who you, you know, really uh, revel in. Um, then in terms of like your internal antenna or or barometer or whatever, like you're, you know, seeking human comfort, uh, 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 nourishing environment. So saying, you know, the city the, is not nourishing. What would be nourishing? You have this internal barometer, almost in the spirit of Christopher Alexander. Uh, then uh, reaching out to people of different specialties, like you, we, we mentioned. Um, finding a new or or like organizing a new environment for research saying you know we need a environment to do the kind of research we need to see how things will be so i think that was about 20 and you know so idea is like if i'm looking for a system of 24 maybe some of these repeated them but like you know already it's it's kind of overwhelming it's interesting so that's um that's where we're at so We'll have more um, such conversations. Um, and I think that they work simply like just to let you talk about your life. Um, Thank you. Is that good? Um, so maybe um, just to conclude, I'm sh maybe our listeners are overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. And so when I feel overwhelmed, I always want to conclude with a play prayer, you know, to kind of like uh, get my, you know, electric charge grounded. So I want to ask you, you know, to lead us uh, all together with a prayer. So it is, of course, uh, a prayer of an agnostic. A prayer of an agnostic, it is uh, saying, whoever you are, wherever you are, don't leave us alone in our struggle to become 
the best that we could be. I normally wouldn't say anything after after prayer. It's so um, it's uh, so uh, divine, but I do dare to just say, like you know, for a you know, you're a lovely person. But this idea of truth as work, right, as linking concepts with uh, you know perceptions with concepts, right, and so that you never quite get there, but you're always working on this. So that's a fascinating just to think about that with regard to an abstract God. You see, like who is kind of like at the end of the road, <laughs> you know, like. Like this uh, concept that is kind of like uh, the most remote, let's say, from any types of perceptions or, you know, et cetera. So there really isn't anything to know or talk to, but just to, but it's it's so obviously present in there. And so I just want to say that's what I see, you know, uh, in you. And so I just uh, say that as my prayer along with you, that I pray with you uh, the words you prayed. Thank you.